Reykjavik, a city on the cusp of the Arctic Circle, and often called one of the most pristine, geographically striking places on Earth. But beyond the glaciers and volcanoes lies an intriguing story of survival that's beautifully captured in Icelandic cuisine. Food, a mirror of society. It brings us together, traces our divergent histories and opens new futures. I'm on a journey to meet food lovers around the world and get the inside track on their cities through the food they love. Reykjavik is the northernmost capital city in the world, settled by Norse arriving by sea. Its very remoteness has forced people to listen to their surroundings and negotiate with nature to stay alive. Iceland was established as a republic in 1944 and grew rapidly. Too rapidly, some would say, for in 2008, its banking system imploded. The currency lost half its value. People lost livelihoods. So I'm intrigued to meet one man who, despite starting his restaurant at what seemed like the worst possible time, managed to turn crisis into opportunity. Gunnar Karl Gislason is the owner of Dill. His restaurant is credited with pioneering the use of locally sourced ingredients, which has helped to revitalize traditional food production. Tell me the story about Dill. So we opened up Dill, and this is 2007. We had literally just quit our jobs and um, started working on our own project. Then the crisis hit the country, and, um, and we kind of Help. You could say we got we got kind of scared. Yes, <laughs> I can imagine. So the, uh, the the investors they jumped off the wagon and and we were kind of uh, alone there and um, we were gonna have like a full blown kitchen with a whole lot of chefs and the same in the restaurant and etc. Mm. But we just had to kind of like change the whole thing and and make it fine dining on a new way. We actually ended up starting uh, the two of us. Uh, we had no employees. And we literally, we worked like 24-7. How did you survive that? I think either it was because we actually managed to uh, serve really nice, uh, well-flavored food uh, and good service, or it was just pure luck. <laughs> <laughs> or As a little bit of both. Are, yeah? <laughs> what is the inspiration for your restaurant now? We started up like going for the Icelandic ingredients, looking up whatever we could actually find. And after a certain time, you felt a little bit like the box was closing and that we needed something more. So I started like digging into like old recipes, sometimes on a specific uh, method on how to make this or that. That kind of inspired me a whole lot on uh, a lot of new plates. As well, it inspired me to go out there and, and look for producers out in the countryside that uh, maybe were doing something that, uh, that were <clears throat> like a kind of old school or something that were done back in the days. For an example, um, how uh, Elmer is making his uh, uh, bacalao. This is called bacalao. In my area, there were about uh, 30 producers producing bacalao this old way. Ah, oh, I love this. But now I'm the only one left. The smaller ones has been bought up by bigger companies. Uh, some have gone bankrupt. Beautiful fillet. Ali, tell me, how long have you been fishing? I'm 60 years old. I started 12 years old at right. sea, working, and as a professional fisherman, 15 years old. How have you managed to survive? This has been difficult, and I have been many times on, on, the, on the brink of uh, 
bankruptcy, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I love to do this. This is the only thing I, I know to do, so I will continue as long as I can stand. I'm so happy with Gunnar and many other chefs here that they respect the old method, how we produce it, you know. I produce it the old way as my grandfather taught my father and my father taught me and, and I'm teaching my grandchildren now. I most definitely hope that I did something right and that did something good and that people are now trying to do a more of uh, foraging or trying to find up more uh, producers that are making something really beautiful happening here in, in Iceland. The land of the midnight sun. Iceland has around 21 hours of daylight at the height of summer and just four in the depths of winter. The landscape of this terrain mesmerizes. Majestic, otherworldly and unforgiving. The natural vegetation provided little firewood, thus creating a unique problem. Beyond the challenges of hunting, gathering and foraging, Icelanders needed a source of heat to cook their food. They didn't have to look far. Okay, let me help you. Oh. You bury it. Inside. And how long does it bake in here for? It takes 11 clukutima. So, do a lot of people bake this way? Eki sandi, eki sandi. Mamma mín bakaði hér brauð. Og það er, þetta er búið að baka brauð hér í í hólum hér alveg í Átta tíu, nýtíu, hundrað á. Hérna bakka ég með brauð, rúgbrauð. What is inside? Þetta er brauð, en rúmjör, hveiti. Ah, it's all steamy out here. Sigur og lyfti duft, salt, mjólk og vatn. Ok. Ég hræri þessu bara svona saman. Whose recipe is this? My family and your... Your family? Yes. It's really soft and moist inside. Mm. Today, many of the traditional Icelandic delicacies including Rupbrov, can be found in Reykjavik's Skorla Portith flea market. These are ram's testicles. Okay. They've been cooked and then soaked in whey milk for uh, about half a year. Okay. That gives them uh, shelf life. And uh, in the older days, people found out that by putting food into the whey milk, it would, it would keep for during the winter. Right. So after slaughtering their animals, they would put a lot of things into whey milk to store it, and then eat it during the winter. What else should I try from your shop? The uh, fermented shark, or the uh, dung smoked uh, salmon and trout. By what sheep kind of dung? Sheep dung. Okay. So here's a wooden smoked salmon. Thank you. Okay. This one tastes like, you know, what you normally get around the world, smoked salmon. Yeah, anyway. A nice little smoky flavor to it. And this is the dung smoked trout. Sheep dung, you say? Yes. In the older days, we cut down all our trees. And the farmers, they had only one way to heat up their houses, which was to take the dung from the sheep after the winter. They dried that during the summertime, okay. and then they would burn it the next winter 
to heat up their houses and of course cook their food. So it was always done sort of in the kitchen area. Then they would start hanging up uh, meats, fish, different things in there for drying and for smoking. And of course found that it was a perfect way of, of storing food, right. smoking it. Yeah. So we've, you know, kept that tradition. You know, I actually prefer this. There's a deeper flavor to it. Oh yeah, definitely. Tourism is one of the sectors that's helped lift Iceland out of its financial doldrums. And traditional delicacies are now packaged and marketed with visitors in mind. Hello. Hello. You're going to get this? Thank you. Thank you. I really like your shop, actually. Thank you very much. How long has it been around? It's nearly 100 years. What would they have sold about 100 years ago? They were selling uh, sugar, wheat. In Iceland, there was not good selection of goods in that time. We were very poor, and uh, the shops were small and very few. Right. And then it was a little bit harder for the owners to keep this shop okay. in the same. Uh, but we have changed it to more uh, ready things and, and chocolates and uh, salts and uh, hard fish for the tourists. Hard fish is uh, dried fish, very popular. Okay. Do you want to try? Uh, well, maybe. Why not? You know, is it? Uh, do you eat it as a snack? Do you? Yeah, we eat it as a snack. Okay. Yeah. It's very healthy. No this fat. one. Yeah. Uh, it's very traditional Icelandic goods. Oh. I like the skier. Uh -huh. This is uh, what uh, people lived on in the old days, actually. Oh, okay. And we keep the tradition. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. High in protein and low in fat. Skier is a yogurt-like cheese that's vital to the dairy industry. My name is Thorgrimur Einar Guðbjartsson and I'm a dairy farmer in Iceland. I'm raised up on a farm as a kid. We have about 350,000 litres of milk per year. Skier was been in Iceland ever since the settlers came here 500 years ago. Skier was made from uh, skim milk because the cream was too valuable. In the early days, you used the cream as a currency. Skir has basically three steps. Pasteurize the milk, warm it up to 85 degrees for about half an hour. Then you cool it down to 40 degrees. You take a small batch of your old skir from last time. You stir it in some of the fresh milk you just pasteurized. Then you start the cooling process. You cool it down to around 20 degrees in maybe three hours. Afterwards, you cool it further down to around six, seven degrees. You take the coagulate, the mixing, and put it in the bags. Take the bags, put it on a tray, and the whey will drain off, and you will have the skir left in the, in the bag. And it's ready to consume. Anybody can make skir, yes, but you have to have high-quality Icelandic milk. And as skier captures a wider market share abroad, it's evolved into something of a national culinary treasure. Iceland has a population of 330,000. Small, but growing, and increasingly from migration. In the past decade, people from more than 140 countries have received citizenship here. National pride is strong, seen even in the clothing. Are these all made in Iceland? Yes, by hand. By hand? Yes. Icelandic women have knitted for centuries, and uh, it's about 50 years since we started to sell it to tourists and to abroad to export it. This is uh, what we call a traditional. The lopa pesa. Lopa pesa, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And what it's makes it the lopa pesa? It's the Icelandic wool. It's very special. Mm -hmm. It's from the Icelandic sheep that has been been here for centuries. And I used to say, the Icelandic sheep, they, they saved us. We ate it and we used the wool and the skin to keep us warm.
Interesting. Seems that sheep are as important as fish in the story of Icelandic survival. Hello. Sole Thomas Dottir is a politician and leading voice for women's issues. She's also a massive foodie who enjoys sharing the cuisine and culture of her home. So, Sole, what are we cooking today? Uh, lamb. Mm -hmm. Lamb leg, actually. And I think it is the most uh, popular meat that we eat. So, like, tell me, when you were growing up, what was a typical meal for you? Boiled fish with potatoes. We ate fish six days a week, and then on Sundays it was lamb. And only with salt, potatoes, maybe some canned cabbage or something. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have many herbs or, you know, vegetables from around the world. So, it was... Very simple, um, not much taste, but it was the Sunday steak. And it was always on Sunday, uh, probably after church, you know, a lunch where the family sat down. I'm seeing you're making something with skier as well. Yes. We make all kinds of things with skier. We make desserts, we eat it for breakfast. I'm making sauce out of it. I put a little bit of basilicum, garlic, uh, honey, salt, oil, and then we make uh, the sauce with the meat. It's a little bit, you know, it's fresh. So all this produce, which is a lot of it, do they grow in Iceland? Or? This is Icelandic, yes. This is all Icelandic. They're making it in greenhouses. We are very lucky here because we have this geothermal heat. You know, it's green energy. We use the geothermal heat to warm up the greenhouses. And it's cheap. Even. It's very cheap, it's yes. It's very cheap, isn't it? Yeah, we are very lucky with that. Otherwise, we would not have all this variety of vegetables. This is really good, Sully. I, the, I love the flavour, it's so moist. Very good. You want some more? I'll never say no. Thank you. Are there a lot of women in politics here? Yes, if you compare it to the rest of the world, there are a lot of women in politics. But still, there have never been as many women as men at the parliament. And we still have a long way to go. But, um, yeah, I think it is. It's quite good to be a woman in Iceland. We have a good welfare system. We have good ed education. We have this pa uh, pretty long parental leave. Mm. Uh, we have a good healthcare system. So it is not as much burden on women at home mm -hmm. as it is for women in many other countries. But still, women are doing more work at home than men. I want to change tracks a little bit and ask you about the financial crisis. How did it get so bad? I think mostly it was because people got too greedy. And not, not the whole society, but the people who ruled. And it was, you know, lack of, um, yeah, what shall we say, social responsibility mm -hmm. that brought us into this. I have this hope that we really learned something from this and that we really, you know, have to be more diverse, we have to embrace the diversity, we have to be, you know, more, um, yeah, we have to be more nice to each other um, and more responsible. Signs of recovery are everywhere. Business is booming. Public debt is on a downward trend, and inflation is low. The International Monetary Fund calls Iceland a success story for getting back on its feet while preserving its prized welfare model. The economy may be gaining steam, but it's still a tough story for Iceland's youth, for whom unemployment has averaged around 10% over the past 12 years. That hasn't deterred some of those studying or working abroad from returning home, bringing with them a new energy and optimism.
Hi there, hey. Eagle. I'm Gerald. Hi, very nice to meet you, Good Gerald. to meet you. I'm Ayif. Go with Eagle. It's easier. All right, I'll do that. Where are we going? We're going uh, up to Leugarberg, the main street of, of Reykjavik. So you've just moved back from America. Yeah, I did. I, I just moved back here to downtown Reykjavik. Uh -huh. What's changed from when you left? Well, not the weather, for one. <laughs> it's always, <laughs> always cold. But uh, business-wise, uh, things have changed. Uh, when I, well, yes, things are bouncing back. When I left, you hardly saw any building cranes. You didn't see the lights in every store, so right. you didn't see all these people. But yeah, now we're going down the main street. It's really busy. Uh, it's busy. Yeah. We're seeing new cafes opening up, new restaurants, and well, much more variety than before. Let's go this way. Okay. Hey, hi, Kota Shalik. This is my friend Gerald, Sema. She's the, this is her family restaurant. Really lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you. This is a Turkish restaurant. It was more than 10 years ago that uh, my father and his business partners, they opened the first kebab in Iceland. Wow. It was something quite uh, new. It wasn't so long time ago that for Turkish coffee and for baklava or, or Turkish food in general, we had to go to Turkey. And I mean, I remember these uh, trips that I came back with full suitcases of, you know, olives, mm. of feta cheese, of, uh, right. you know, interesting spices and things like this. Now, I either come here, I go to the Turkish supermarkets uh, to buy my things, uh, and I go home and cook it myself. I mean, this is something that just changed in the last recent years. I went to the Middle East a couple of years ago, and then when I came back, I felt like I needed to explain a falafel to everyone. Yes. But now, if I say a falafel or if I say a kebab, people yes. will know. My father is from Turkey. Uh, he came here, I would say, more than 30 years ago. My mother is Icelandic. It's quite an interesting setup to grow up in. In the last recent years, I mean, immigration has been growing. Probably you wouldn't have talked about multiculturalism 10 years ago. So this is quite new, a new phenomenon to Iceland and the Icelandic culture. Both of you are young professionals. Where do you see your country heading? Well, things would have to change mm -hmm. for young people to be able to build a future here. Mm -hmm. The problem is lack of jobs for graduates. You can't really buy your own home here, mm -hmm. even though it would be cheaper than to rent. Food prices are higher here. I, it's so many things. So you just came back. What's, what's next? What's the next step? Uh, you sound like my mother when you ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yes, Eagle. <laughs> what are you going to do next? <laughs> well, I'm optimistic. Um, I think we are bouncing back. We are a small economy, we're a small nation, where every, every working uh, productive citizen matters. So there is often, uh, it is often not that hard to find work, maybe compared to the rest of the Europe, say. So it's a matter of maybe finding what you, what you, what you want to do, what you inspire to do, and you know. What I, do you want to do? Ah, ah. I'm available for hiring. <laughs> <laughs> Accustomed to isolation, Icelanders have gained a knack for overcoming the seemingly insurmountable Armed with lessons from the past, they're placing faith in what lies ahead. Iceland may have grabbed headlines because of its recent economic woes, but people here say those days are over. By returning to their roots, they survived and emerged more resilient. And one of the most tangible outcomes of that is modern Icelandic cuisine, both contemporary and sustainable, which has turned Reykjavik into one delicious city. Until next time, or as they say in Icelandic, bless bless.